Okay, today is the 15th of August eh? and we are on the 35th chapter of the Sangyutta Nikaya, Salayatana Sangyutta. Now we come to Sutta 35.240. The Buddha said, no? Monks, in the past, the tortoise was searching for food along the bank of a river one evening. On that same evening, a jackal was also searching for food along the bank of that same river. When the tortoise saw the jackal in the distance searching for food, it drew its limbs and neck inside its shell and passed the time keeping still and silent. The jackal had also seen the tortoise in the distance searching for food, so he approached and waited close by, thinking, when this tortoise extends one or another of its limbs or its neck, I will grab it right on the spot, pull it out and eat it. But because the tortoise did not extend any of its limbs or its neck, the jackal, failing to gain access to it, lost interest in it and departed. So two monks, Marat the evil one, is constantly and continually waiting close by you, thinking, perhaps I will gain access to him through the eye, or through the ear, or through the nose, or tongue, or body, or mind. Therefore, monks, dwell guarding the doors of the sense faculties. Having seen a form with the eye, do not grasp its signs and features, since if you leave the eye faculty unguarded, Evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. Practice the way of its restraint. Guard the eye faculty. Undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. Similarly, having heard a sound with the ear, smelled an odor with the nose, severed a taste with the tongue, felt a tactile object with the body, cognize a thought, do not grasp its features and signs. Since if you leave the faculties unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. Practice the way of its restraint. Guard the faculties. Undertake the restraint of the faculties. When monks, you dwell guarding the doors of the sense faculties. Mara, the evil one, failing to gain access to you, will lose interest and depart, just as the jackal departed from the tortoise. Drawing in the mind's thoughts as a tortoise draws its limbs into its shell, independent, not harassing others, fully quenched, a monk would not blame anyone. So, that's the end of the sutta. So, this is a very interesting sutta. So, this tortoise was, was walking along the banks of the river looking for food. Suddenly, so he saw this jackal. Jackal is something like a bigger fox something like a wild dog and uh, he was also looking for food and this tortoise would be a good food for this jackal so the tortoise quickly withdrew its four limbs and its neck inside the shell and dare not come out so this jackal was waiting and waiting and waiting for him if any of the limbs or the head comes out he was thinking he would bite it and grab it out and eat it up, but the tortoise dare not come out. So after some time he got tired and he left. So the Buddha says in the same way, Mara is waiting to catch us at the six sense doors. If we come out, out of our domain, out of our territory, then we will get caught by Mara. In some other sutta, the Buddha says that our territory, we should only be at the uh, four objects of Satipatthana. Uh, if we pay attention uh, to the sense objects, uh, that means forms, smells, tastes and all that, uh, then uh, we will get caught by Mara. Mara is always waiting uh, at the sense doors uh, to catch us. Uh, so we have to be very careful. Uh, that's why the Buddha says, uh, don't observe the signs and the details uh, of whatever you see or hear, or smell, etc. So then you won't get interested in it, uh, won't get caught. Uh, uh, but it's a good warning. Uh.
The next sutta is another famous sutta, simile of the law, 35.241. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Kosambi, on the bank of the river Ganges. The Blessed One saw a great log being carried along by the current of the river Ganges. And he addressed the monks thus, Do you see, monks, that great log being carried along by the current of the river Ganges? Yes, Venerable Sir. If, monks, that log does not veer towards the near shore, does not veer towards the far shore, does not sing in midstream, does not get cast up on high ground, does not get caught by human beings, does not get caught by non-human beings, does not get caught in a whirlpool, and does not become inwardly rotten, it will slant, slope, and incline towards the ocean. For what reason? Because the current of the river Ganges slants, slopes, and inclines towards the ocean. So too, monks, if you do not veer towards the near shore, do not veer towards the far shore, do not sink in midstream, do not get cast up on high ground, do not get caught by human beings, do not get caught by non-human beings, do not get caught in a whirlpool, and do not become inwardly rotten, you will slant, slope, and incline towards Nibbana. For what reason? Because right view slant, slopes, and inclines towards Nibbana. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, this big log huh, is uh, flowing along this uh, river Ganges, which is a big river. Huh? And uh, as we know, uh, all the rivers uh, flow into the ocean. So this uh, river water uh, is bringing the log uh, towards the ocean. And if it does not get caught uh, by all these conditions, uh, that means get caught on the near shore, uh, do not veer towards the far shore, the two banks. Uh, it does not sink in midstream, does not get cast on the high ground, does not caught, get caught by human beings or non-human beings, uh, does not get uh, caught in a whirlpool uh, and does not rot. Uh, then it will follow the uh, river water and keep flowing until it reaches the ocean. Uh. So the Buddha says in a similar way, if we have right view, then unless we get uh, distracted, uh, caught uh, by these conditions, uh, then uh, we will naturally slope, uh, incline towards Nibbana, just like the log uh, will go towards the ocean. So with right view, uh, you will go towards Nibbana. So that shows uh, right view is extremely important. If you don't have right view, you cannot you have no chance of going towards Nibbana. So we always like to stress that right view is extremely important. And right view we know from the Majima Nikaya Sutta 43. There are two conditions for right view. One is the voice of another. That means you have to hear the Dhamma from another person. You cannot get, get right view by yourself. It must with that be with the help of somebody teaching you the Dhamma. And the second condition is proper attention. You pay proper attention, full attention. Uh, then only you can achieve uh, right view. Uh, so that's why listening to the Dhamma is so important. The Buddha always stresses uh, Bahu Satcha, much knowledge of the Buddha's Dhamma, that means the suttas. Uh, when this was said, a certain monk asked the Blessed One, What, Venerable Sir, is the near shore? What is the far shore? What is sinking in midstream? What is getting cast up on high ground? What is getting caught by human beings? What is getting caught by non-human beings? What is getting caught in a whirlpool? What is inward rottenness? And the Buddha said, Monk, the near shore, this is a designation for the six internal sense bases, that means the six sense organs. Huh? The far shore, this is a designation for the six external sense bases, that means the sense objects. Huh? Sinking in midstream, this is a designation for delight and lust. Getting cast up on high ground, this is a designation for the conceit I am. And what 
Mang is getting caught by human beings. Here someone lives in association with lay people. He rejoices with them and sorrows with them. He is happy when they are happy and sad when they are sad. And he evolves himself in their affairs and duties. This is called getting caught by human beings. And what monk is getting caught by non-human beings? Here someone lives the holy life with the aspiration to be reborn into a certain order of devas, thinking, by this virtue or vow or austerity or holy life, I will become a deva or one among the devas. This is called getting caught by non-human beings. Getting caught in a whirlpool, this monk is a designation for the five courts of sensual pleasure. And what monk is inward rottenness? Here someone is immoral, one of evil character, of impure and suspect behavior, secretive in his acts, no ascetic though claiming to be one, not a celibate though claiming to be one, inwardly rotten, corrupt, depraved. This is called inward rottenness. I'll stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha is explaining uh, that the near shore is the six sense, uh, six sense organs, uh, internal sense bases. Uh, the far shore is the six external sense objects, uh, external sense bases, uh, is, uh, sense objects. Uh. So if you veer towards the near shore or veer towards the far shore, uh, that means uh, you have desire uh, for the six sense bases, uh, lust for the six sense bases. Or you have desire and lust uh, for the sense objects, uh, sight, sound, smell, taste and all that. Uh. And the sinking in midstream uh, is delight and lust. Uh, delight and lust uh, for sensual pleasures. Uh. Hmm. Getting cast up on high ground, this is a designation for the conceit I am. Uh, so, just now if you have desire and lust, uh, you will sing. Uh, so, and then uh, getting cast up on high ground, you get stuck on high ground uh, because of conceit. Uh, the I am, the ego. Uh, so you cannot flow, you cannot flow towards Nibbana. Uh, similarly for just now the delight and lust. Uh, if you sing, then you cannot flow towards Nibbana. Getting caught by human beings is associating too much with lay people. For a monk, that is not proper. Then to behave like a lay person for a monk, then you cannot go towards Nibbana. And caught by non-human beings is thinking that you are living the holy life so that you can be reborn as a deva. Uh, so that is another obstacle uh, to attaining Nibbana. Uh, you still want to go for rebirth. Uh. Getting caught in a whirlpool uh, is the five causes of sensual pleasure. Uh. Mm. So five causes of sensual pleasure uh, will turn us around like a whirlpool. Uh, and make us sing. Uh. Instead of going towards Nibbana, he will sing there. And inward rottenness uh, is a monk uh, of uh, evil character, uh, a hypocrite. Uh. Shows outside is a good monk, but inside na, he is impure, rotten. Na. So if that's the case, na, he rots within, na, he cannot, just like wood, na, when the wood rots, na, the log, when it rots, na, it will sing. Na. So similarly, na, if a monk is uh, rotten inside, na, then he will sing, na. he cannot flow towards Nibbana. Mm. Now on that occasion, the cow herd Nanda was standing near the Blessed One. He then said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I will not veer towards the near shore. I will not veer towards the far shore. I will not sink in midstream. I will not get cast up on high ground. I will not get caught by human beings. I will not get caught by non-human beings. I will not get caught in a whirlpool. I will not become inwardly rotten. May I receive the going forth under the Blessed One. May I receive the higher ordination. And the Buddha said, in that case, Nanda, return the cows to their owners. And he said, the cows will go back of their own accord, Venerable Sir, out of attachment to the calves. And the Buddha said, return the cows to their owners, Nanda. Then the cow heard Nanda return the cows to their owners, came back to the Blessed One and said, the cows have been returned to their owners, Venerable Sir. May I receive the going forth under the Blessed One. May I receive the higher ordination. Stop here for a moment. So here, 
this Nanda, he wants to ordain with the Buddha, and he has been looking after all these cows, uh, and usually, uh, uh, if he leaves the cows alone, uh, they will wander back, uh, back to their cow pen uh, because of the calves, uh, attachment to the calves. Uh. But the Buddha thought uh, that he is going to become a monk. Uh. He has to make sure uh, that the cows are uh, given back to the owners uh, and the owners know uh, that the cows have been returned to them. Then only uh, he goes forth. Uh, there is nothing that is unsettled. Uh. Uh, a lot of people uh, are very careless over these uh, minor things. Uh, they think it's so minor. Huh? Cows will naturally go back. Why am I going to go and return them to the owner? But uh, the Buddha is very particular about these things uh, because uh, it is important. Uh, it's important because uh, if you go forth as a monk uh, and you you assume uh, that the cows will go back, uh, along the way maybe some cow thieves will steal will kill the cow, uh, maybe one or two of the cows, uh, and uh, uh, the cows don't go back. Uh. In that case, uh, then uh, the owner will suspect uh, that this Nanda stole the cow. Uh. That's why sometimes some people, uh, they think uh, the teacher is too fussy. Uh, small things are so, so fussy. But actually it's important because it doesn't have the wisdom, so it doesn't think it's important. Then the cowherd Nanda received the going forth under the Blessed One, and he received the higher ordination. And soon, not long after his higher ordination, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, resolute, Venerable Nanda became one of the Arahants. So, this sutta is a very famous sutta about the log flowing towards the ocean. So, if we go through life, uh, the stream, the river of life, uh, every time we flow along the river of life, uh, every birth uh, we suffer. And then as we suffer, uh, we become more and more mature. Uh. As you become more and more mature, uh, then we start to ask uh, uh, why we suffer. Uh, and then uh, you want to find a way out of suffering. Uh. Uh, so... And then we search, uh, we search, and then if you come across the Dhamma, then if you get the right view, uh, uh, then you will naturally flow towards Nibbana. Uh. So unless uh, these uh, obstacles, uh, there are several obstacles uh, uh, mentioned here, uh, don't veer towards the near shore, don't veer towards the far shore, don't sink in the midstream, or get cast on high ground, etc., uh. Okay, the next sutta is 35.243. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sakyans at Kapilavatu in Nigroda's Park. On that occasion, a new assembly hall had just been built for the Sakyans of Kapilavatu, and it had not yet been inhabited by any ascetic or Brahmin or any human being at all. Then the Sakyans of Kapilavatu approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Venerable Sir, a new council hall has just been built for the Sakyans of Kapilavatu, and it has not yet been inhabited by any ascetic or Brahmin or by any human being at all. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One be the first to use it. When the Blessed One has used it first, then the Sakyans of Kapilavatu will use it afterwards. That will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Stop here for a moment. Nah. The Buddha is a Sakyan, belongs to the Sakya clan. Nah. So, this Kapilavatu, these people nah, are all related to him. Nah. So, they had just be built a hall nah, and not yet used. Nah. They wanted him to use it first. Nah. Then, after that, nah, they will use it. Nah. So, from here, nah, some people... Nah, they, they follow this tradition. Uh, sometimes they buy a new house. Uh, they invite some monk to go and stay first. Uh. Uh, I've had that experience. Uh, but uh, sometimes these people, uh, they think monks are very ascetic. Uh. They invite the monk to the house and then they just provide a mat. Uh, expect him to sleep on the cold floor. <laughs> Young monk, maybe boleh lah. Old monk, susah. <laughs> The Blessed One consented by silence. Then when the Sakyans understood that the Blessed One had consented, they rose from their seats, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on their right, 
they went to the new assembly hall. They covered it thoroughly with mats, prepared seats, put out a large water jug, and hung up an oil lamp. Then they approached the Blessed One and informed him of this, adding, Let the Blessed One come at his own convenience. Then the Blessed One dressed, and taking bowl and robe, went together with the Sangha of monks to the new assembly hall. After washing his feet, he entered the hall and sat down against the central pillar facing east. The monks too, after washing their feet, entered the hall and sat down against the western wall facing east with the Blessed One in front of them. The Sakyans of Kapilavatu too, after washing their feet, entered the hall and sat down against the eastern wall facing west with the Blessed One in front of them. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here you see the Buddha sat uh, facing east. This uh, in uh, yoga, it is recommended uh, that when we meditate, uh, we face the east. Uh. So here also you notice the Buddha faces the east. Uh. Uh, just like we meditate, uh, we face the east. Uh. So the monks uh, sat behind the Buddha and the lay people sat facing the Buddha. The Blessed One then instructed, exhorted, inspired and gladdened the Sakyans with the Dharma talk through much of the night, after which he dismissed them, saying, The night has passed, Gotamas. You may go at your own convenience. Stop here for a moment. I see he called them Gotamas because they are the same, same clan as him. He's also a Gotama. Yes, Venerable Sir, they replied. Then they rose from their seats, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on their right, they departed. Then not long after the Sakyans of Kapilavatu had left, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Maha Moggallana thus, The Sangha of monks is free from sloth and torpor, Moggallana. Give a Dharma talk to the monks. My back is aching, so I will stretch it. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Maha Moggallana replied. Then the Blessed One prepared his outer robe, folded in four, and lay down on his right side in the lion's posture, with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and clearly comprehending, after noting in his mind the idea of rising. Stop here for a moment. So here you see the Buddha took his outer robe, this one that we wear, and folded it in four layers. And he lay down uh, uh, on the right side uh, in the lion's posture. Thereupon the Venerable Maha Moglana addressed the monks thus, Friends, monks, friend, those monks replied, The Venerable Maha Moglana said this, I will teach you, friends, an exposition on the corrupted and the uncorrupted. Listen to it and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, friend, those monks replied. The Venerable Maha Moglana said, how, friends, is one corrupted? Here, having seen a form with the eye, a monk is intent upon a pleasing form and repelled by a displeasing form. He dwells without having set up mindfulness of the body with a limited mind, and he does not understand as it really is that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. Similarly, having heard a sound, having smelled an odor, etc. He is uh, intent upon a pleasing phenomena and repelled by a displeasing phenomena. He dwells without having set up mindfulness of the body with a limited mind and he does not understand as it really is that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. This is called Friends, a monk who is corrupted amidst forms cognizable by the eye, corrupted amidst sounds cognizable by the ear, corrupted amidst odors cognizable by the nose, corrupted amidst taste cognizable by the tongue, corrupted amidst touch or tactile objects cognizable by the body, corrupted amidst thoughts cognizable by the mind. When a monk dwells thus, if Mara approaches him through the eye, Mara gains access to him. Mara gets a hold on him. If Mara approaches him through the ear or through the nose, tongue, body and mind, Mara gains access to him. Mara gets a hold on him. 
stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says, uh, one who is corrupted, uh, is corrupted by forms, sounds, smells, taste, touch, and thoughts. Uh, he is moved by them, uh, corrupted by them. Uh. That means if he's pleasing, uh, he attaches to it. Uh. Uh, if he's uh, uh, displeasing, uh, then he feels aversion for it. Uh. Uh. Suppose, friends, there is a shed made of reeds or of grass, dried up, desiccated, past its prime. If a man approaches it from the east with a blazing grass torch, or from the west, from the north, from the south, from below, or from above, whichever way he approaches it, the fire gains access to it. The fire gets a hold on it. So too, friends, when a monk dwells thus, if Mara approaches him to the eye, to the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, Mara gains access to him. Mara gets a hold on him. When a monk dwells thus, forms overwhelm him. He does not overwhelm form. Sounds overwhelm him. He does not overwhelm sounds. Odors overwhelm him. He does not overwhelm odors. Tastes overwhelm him. He does not overwhelm taste. Touch or tactile objects overwhelm him. He does not overwhelm touch or tactile objects. Thoughts overwhelm him. He does not overwhelm thoughts. This is called, friends, a monk who is overwhelmed by forms, overwhelmed by sounds, odors, taste, touch, and thoughts. One who is overwhelmed and who does not overwhelm. Evil and wholesome states have, have overwhelmed him, states that defile, that lead to renewed existence, that bring trouble, that result in suffering, and that leads to future birth, aging, and death. It is in this way, friends, that one is corrupted. Uh, so here the Buddha says, uh, uh, if a monk uh, is, uh, the mind uh, is not disciplined, uh, then when the six sense objects impinge uh, on his senses, uh, he's moved by them. Uh, either he craves uh, if they are pleasing uh, or if they are displeasing, uh, then he feels aversion for them. Uh, uh. So because he's uh, overwhelmed by these uh, six sense objects, uh, then once he's overwhelmed, uh, the, the mind moves, uh, these uh, unwholesome states rise, uh, and these unwholesome states uh, lead to rebirth. Uh, rebirth means uh, future dukkha, uh, aging, sickness, and death. Uh. And how, friends, is one uncorrupted? Here, having seen a form with the eye, a monk is not intent upon a pleasing form and not repelled by a displeasing form. He dwells having set up mindfulness of the body with a measureless mind and he understands as it really is that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. Similarly, having heard a sound with the ear, smelt an odor, tasted a taste, etc., he is not intent upon a pleasing sense object and not repelled by a displeasing sense object. He dwells having set up mindfulness of the body with a measureless mind, and he understands as it really is, that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. This is called, friends, a monk who is uncorrupted amidst forms cognizable by the eye, uncorrupted amidst sounds cognizable by the ear, uh, uncorrupted amidst odors, taste, touch, and thoughts. When a monk dwells thus, if Mara approaches him to the eye, Mara fails to gain access to him. Mara fails to get a hold on him. Similarly, if Mara approaches him to the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, Mara fails to gain access to him. Mara fails, fails to get a hold on him. Suppose, friends, there is a peak house or a hall built of thickly packed clay and freshly plastered. If a man approaches it from the east with a blazing grass torch, or from the west, or from the north, from the south, from below, or from above, whichever way he approaches it, the fire fails to gain access to it. The fire fails to get a hold on it. So too, friends, when a monk dwells thus, if Mara approaches him to the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, Mara fails to gain access to him. Mara fails to get a hold on him. When a monk dwells thus, he overwhelms forms. Forms do not overwhelm him. 
he overwhelms sounds, sounds do not overwhelm him. Similarly, he overwhelms odors, taste, touch, thoughts. Lah. This is called friends, among who overwhelms forms, sounds, etc. One who overwhelms and who is not overwhelmed. He has overwhelmed those evil and wholesome states that defile, that lead to renewed existence, that bring trouble, that result in suffering and that leads to future birth, aging and death. It is in this way, friends, that one is uncorrupted. Stop here for a moment. So here you see Rebbe Maham Moglana says, uh, one is, who is uncorrupted uh, when he is uh, uh, contacted uh, by these six sense objects, uh, uh, he is not intent upon a pleasing object uh, or repelled by a displeasing object. He dwells having set up mindfulness of the body with a measureless mind. With a measureless mind, that means his mind is uh, very well developed. Uh. He has very high concentration. A monk with a very high concentration, uh, with a very um, strong concentration. Uh. The mind is like a rock, uh, not easily shaken. Uh. Uh, so these uh, external sense objects uh, cannot move him because he dwells within the mind most of the time. Uh, uh, so he has uh, his uh, foundation uh, inside uh, is very strong, uh, so not easily shaken. Uh. In the first case, uh, the person uh, who is undeveloped in the mind, uh, then uh, his mind is easily moved. Uh. So the simile given uh, is uh, you have a uh, Shed uh, made of dried reeds and grass and all that. Uh. If a man uh, comes uh, with a blazing torch, uh, with a fire, uh, he will easily catch fire. Uh. Uh, in the second case, uh, uh, the mind that does not move uh, is like a house uh, built of clay uh, and freshly plastered. Uh. You bring fire to it also, uh, you cannot burn the clay. Uh. Then the Blessed One got up and addressed the Venerable Maha Moglana thus, Good, good Moglana, you have spoken well to the monks, the exposition on the corrupted and the uncorrupted. This is what the Venerable Moglana said. The teacher approved. Elated, those monks delighted in the Venerable Maha Moglana statement. That's the end of the sutta. So here you see the Buddha went to this hall to stay for the night because he was invited by the Sakyans. And then he gave a talk to them. After the talk, uh, it must be getting late. Uh, so they went back, maybe about 10 or 11 at night. Uh. And then the Buddha said, uh, the monks are all still very what, uh, alert. Uh, they, they don't have sloth and topper. So he asked Mabel Moglana to give a talk to them. So Mabel Moglana gave this talk. Uh. See how uh, Buddha and his disciples, uh, they really uh, value the Dhamma. So uh, even though many of them are already Arahans, uh, they still like to discuss Dhamma. Mm.